you've got a beautiful uh, special duty. Yes. And yes. a great children's story. There are actually four special things today for this community. Yes. And to show how rare 100 years is, insurance companies calculate that the average male will die before he's 80 years old. So that shows you, from the insurance perspective, how a small number of people will live that long. But just think, in a resurrection morning, a thousand years will pass. And we'll be acquainted. Before we do have to repopulate this great planet. So if you open your Bibles to um, Luke 24, and while you're opening your Bibles, I want to share with you a parable. A man was walking along the edge of a cliff. And he really got too close and the cliff crumbled and he fell over the cliff. All the way down, as he was thinking, can anything worse happen? Something good happened to him. A tree was growing out of that, 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 that cliff and he grabbed the tree and he screamed and he hollered for help. But there was no, no response. So he said, Lord, save me. I'll do anything for you. I'll go to church, I'll read the Bible, I'll be a faithful tither, I'll do anything you want. Just save me. And then he heard a voice that said, did you really mean that? Yes, Lord, yes. Do you trust me? Oh, yes, Lord. Do you trust me unconditionally? Yes, Lord. Then let go. <laughs> and the man responded, what did you say? He said, let go. And the man said, is there anybody else out there? <laughs> How much do we trust God? Mm -hmm. Things are going on in our life and we're wondering, Lord, what exactly are you trying to accomplish? Verse 13. Now behold, two men were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. So it was late in the afternoon. It was the day of the resurrection. These men were there for Passover. They had heard the stories of Jesus not being in his tomb. They had heard the stories of the women going to the tomb and having talked to Jesus. But they just didn't believe it. They, they had not checked out the evidence. They were confused and they were discouraged. They, as I said, they had not personally seen the evidence as to whether the resurrection was real or if it was made up. And not only had they not seen the evidence, they really weren't willing to go and check it out. Because they were fearful that if they went to Jerusalem, they would be arrested and probably crucified. And so they decided to pack it in and head home and go back to their old way of life. Isn't that incredible? You hear about the resurrection and you say, and hey, it's not true. They gave up on Jesus. Aren't you glad that Jesus never gives up on us? Amen. And as they were walking, the scripture says, a stranger came up alongside them. But they were so absorbed in their depression that they didn't recognize who it was. They continued their discussion wondering about the lessons that Jesus had taught them that they didn't really understand. Could a man like this, who did all the things that he did, is it possible that he could be the Messiah? And as this stranger walked beside them, tears flowed from their eyes. And Jesus wanted to comfort those tears. He wanted to wipe them from their eyes. But first, he was going to give them a lesson in Old Testament history about the Messiah. He wanted to leave them with hope. So in verse 17, he says, you know, he said, what are you guys talking about? And they said, what are these things you're talking about while you walk? And the two men stopped and looked at him and they said, are you the only person in Jerusalem who, who hasn't heard what happened? And they told him about his, their master, verses 19 and 20. 
He was a prophet who did many powerful things. But our leaders handed him over to the Romans and they killed him. And with quivering lips they added in verse 21, We were hoping that he would free Israel. And, that, and this is the third day since it happened. It's strange, they, they didn't remember. And Jesus said on the third day, he would rise from the grave. Now the priest remember, they had extra guards posted at the tomb because they feared that he might actually rise on the third day or that someone might come and try to steal his body and make it appear as if there was a resurrection. Jesus knew the needs of these men and he drew near to them. I don't know what your translation says, but the King James, I like the way it says it. It says that Jesus drew near to them. Now, he isn't talking about these two men being geographically apart, but their faith was apart. Their faith was distant from God, and he drew near to them. And aren't you glad that when we wander away, that God doesn't say to us, well, you're on your own. Aren't you glad he never does that to us? Amen. He's always willing to be there for us even when we don't want him there. Life fogs up our vision and our understanding, our faith and our hope. We allow our circumstances to shadow truth. It's easy to fall into the cycle of depression, to lose focus. It's easy to doubt. It's easy to forget. It's easy to fall away. It's easy to reject. It's easy to take for granted. It's easy to misunderstand. It's easy to give up and give in. But thank God that despite our circumstances, despite our frequency of getting lost, and despite our willingness to hop on a plane and try to get away from our circumstances, that God draws near to us. And that is good news. That is, that is grace. That is Jesus Christ. And he spoke to these two men for hours, explaining the scriptures, showing them what they had misunderstood about the Messiah. He was physically next to them. They saw him. They heard him. They walked with him. But they did not recognize him. Thank God. He never leaves us alone. No matter how dark our hour becomes, He never leaves us alone. We may feel alone, but the truth is, we are never alone. Some of you may say, well, where was your God on September 11, or in the Las Vegas shooting, or in the Sutherland Springs massacre? And the answer to the question is, right next to you. He weeps with us, he cries with us. He knows we live in a sinful world and terrible things are happening because of sin. God has made a promise and he is a keeper of his promises. He said that he will never abandon us, that he'll always be beside us. Now many times we can't see God in our circumstances, but he's still there. He is still in the midst of the darkness that surrounds us. He is the only light sometimes that we have. We may be blind to his presence, but he's there. Verse 20, verse 30, excuse me. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, and he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them. Verse 31, then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. In verse 32, they said unto one another, did not our hearts burn within us while, we, while he talked with us? on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us. My friends, today we are modern day disciples walking the road of Emmaus. And to modern day disciples, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Amen. Not just think about me, but remember me. Be intimate with me. Because communion is a very intimate act. It helps us focus on Jesus instead of ourselves. 
points us to the one who has always been with us through every trial, through the good days and the bad days. He reminds us of his constant love and that he is constantly beside us. God wants our eyes open just as those disciples' eyes were open. And that's why we gather here for communion, to remember him. Those disciples went from being in a state of despair to hope, from depression to joy, from doubt to belief, from defeat to victory, from dismay to courage, from disillusionment to enlightenment. And what a change. And realize it was Jesus who broke the bread. And today we break bread. We remember this historic event with these common elements. We remember to let go and to trust God. Amen. I suddenly had this we first participate in foot washing service. Now, I don't realize some of you may not have come prepared for foot washing, and that's perfectly fine. You welcome to remain your seat, move and play some music. Now, the ladies are going to go into this building on the far right side, first door on the far right? No, blue door. Blue door. Okay. All the way to the end. Thank you. And the men are going to go to the fellowship hall. And those who would like to do communion as a family, the church office right here in the corner. I'm just going to come that door is. I think it's perfect. Any questions about where we're going? Men to the fellowship hall, women down to the end on the right side, the men and the cutting families on the left corner. You know, when you come back, which row starts first? The first row. So we'll sit every other row starting with the first row. Thank you.